as you know, the, the two thirds of the, um, the of the pilgrims coming to the Holy Land are Christians. So, but the question is once again if I can, we can transform the pilgrimage in uh, interreligious pilgrimage uh, for peace. First of all, uh, I have to explain how we, at least myself, understand the pilgrimage. What is the pilgrimage? The nature of the pilgrimage. Uh, uh, only after that we can we can uh, say if this is possible or not. First of all, the pilgrimage to the Holy Land is um, an experience. Should become it is an experience to meet uh, the holy places. Uh, there is a, a one thing that is possible to find only. Uh, I'm talking once again from the Christian point of view, holy in holy land, the holy places. And all the land uh, is holy in a way, because uh, like another, but now from the Christian point of view, Christianity is incarnation. If there is an incarnation, there is also a place where the incarnation took place. So, uh, and this is on here. So the pilgrimage to the holy land is a uh, unique. There are pilgrimage to many other parts of the world, but the pilgrimage to the holy land is unique. Is uh, to go to the foot, to the roots of the, uh, your faith as Christian. Of course. All the land is witness and testimony of the incarnation, of the revelation, because the revelation is historic. There is a history, as I said many times, history of salvation. There is also a geography of salvation. If you remove the geography of salvation, there is no also history. So, and this is unique for the Holy Land here for these places. And the holy places, uh, they uh, are the memory of some important uh, passages of the history of the revelation. Of course, mainly uh, connected to the New Testament, not only, but um, uh, mostly connected to the New Testament. So the pilgrimage to the Holy Land is also pilgrimage, first of all, not only, but first of all, to meet the holy places. That means to meet this experience of the uh, uh, connection between history and geography, between event and place, between also what um, uh, our the content of our faith is in the scriptures. So to see in the scripture we are written here, so mostly, and to connect uh, what everyone believes, what everyone had in every part of the world to the land, to the place. This is an experience so that when the pilgrimage, the Christian pilgrimage, first and foremost things, then of course is also experience of faith. You come here uh, uh, with a, faith, a motive, religious motivation. Uh, also, there is also there are also cultural aspects, of course, but these are secondary, not uh, is not uh, essential. And the pilgrimage is not pilgrimage for peace, but the pilgrimage. For definition, is connected to peace. The uh, motivation of the pilgrimage is religious, and uh, always been that. So, and uh, the pilgrims uh, can, uh, don't come to Holy Land in order to understand the political situation, to understand the geography or whatever. They come first and foremost. That also can be the secondary aspect. But the first aspect is religious to make experience of faith. Um, that I had a few of, uh, of you came from uh, Switzerland to here. They crossed all the borders, countries that are in war among them, but the pilgrims is a sacred here. Uh, they cross all the borders in order to arrive here and they were fully respected. Even here, the pilgrims are the only uh, person uh, that can go to every corner of the country. Israelis cannot go to the uh, territories. Palestinians mostly cannot go to Israel, but pilgrims cannot can, can go everywhere because the nature of the pilgrimage is in this. The second aspect uh, is that, uh, of course, when you come here uh, uh, as Christian, you are exposed most mostly for most of the Christians for the first time. You are exposed uh, to uh, the understanding and the presence of other Christians. Uh, for the Catholics, uh, mostly, uh, I am Catholic, as you can, I presume you know, understand this. Uh, most, uh, when they, they come here, they, they see for the first time Orthodox uh, from different traditions. So it also becomes also um, an encounter with the, uh, the roots of the church as Christians, but that are not only places, but also communities. 
the communities here, the Christian communities, are uh, taking care and keeping this uh, Christian tradition, different Christian traditions, uh, that are not always easy to understand, as you uh, can, uh, the locals understand very well. Even yesterday we had problems in Bethlehem, as usual. Uh, the, this difference between the Christians is not always understandable, but is the first exposure, exposure, exposure the first meeting with this reality, which is important because uh, the, uh, we understand after the pilgrimage to the Holy Land what really uh, ecumenism is and the uh, ecumenical dialogue is and why it's so important. Uh, the pilgrimage has also become, uh, the, for the Christians, become also an encounter and meeting with a uh, political situation. You cannot avoid this. When you are in uh, Galilee, everything is beautiful, wonderful, and gorgeous. When you have to go to Bethlehem, you will see the wounds of the land and, uh, uh, and of the relations here. This become also an issue. Uh, why the land of the revelation, the land that uh, gave to us the peace, or uh, the, the, the prince of peace, uh, is not in peace. Uh, this is the, the question that uh, all the pilgrims put. I meet every year thousands of pilgrims, and everyone, all the, the, the groups ask the same, uh, the same thing. How do you the, uh, what do you answer? I don't. Um, I, I don't have answers. <laughs> I have my own answers, but it's now in ten minutes. I cannot. <laughs> After, if you want, there are beautiful answers. Not definitive answer. This is impossible to have. I don't know if you have. We can give you a Nobel Prize. Uh, um, uh, the meeting, uh, the um, pilgrimage to Holy Land, also the, uh, for many Christians, the first time they see. Jews and Muslims in their own context. Jews and Muslims are very, everywhere, of course, but uh, here they, you see for the first time, for, for the average Christians, Muslims and Jews in their own context, their own traditions, their own uh, habits, and, and so on. This is also uh, raised a lot of questions, a lot of curiosity, and uh, this is important. Uh, so it means that the pilgrimage to the Holy Land for the Christians is an encounter with the roots of your faith, to the places, with the land, but you discover also that the land is not just uh, stones and land and the desert, are also people that are connected with the land, and so it's an uh, opening uh, to the faith, of course, but also to the encounter. The encounter with, the, uh, with Jesus, with the heart of the faith, cannot be separated uh, with the, by the encounter with the people that also are possessing the different traditions. So uh, the answer, can the pilgrimage be transformed in uh, interreligious pilgrimage for peace? I think uh, it depends what you mean. Uh, uh, together, I don't think so, because everyone has his own experience of faith. Uh, the God is the same God, we say, at least. Uh, but uh, there are different ways to, to read. There are different ways, different habits that we cannot uh, put off. <coughs> Uh, it's difficult, it's not impossible, but it's not uh, easy to uh, have common prayers, to have a common experience of faith, because we have different dynamics, different languages in all the aspects. But this is not a problem. Uh, the pilgrimage here at least in the land can become an occasion in order to show that the diversity and the other way in which you express your faith are not necessarily a challenge to you, uh, or negative challenges are an opportunity to encounter, encounter, to, uh, opportunity to meet, opportunity to learn, and also to appreciate. Why not? Like, so it's, uh, it, it's also not practical. Uh, last year, the pilgrims, the Christian pilgrims, are about three millions, almost three millions. Obviously, you cannot have three millions of encounters, three millions of uh, interreligious experience, and, and so on. This can be done only uh, for uh, selected groups that have a special training, special preparation, and special opening. Uh, so it's not for everyone. It cannot become a common experience, obviously. And I close, 10 minutes already finished, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, it's, uh, according to my experience, uh, most of the pilgrims, at least Christian pilgrims, are coming with roots. 
the, uh, the role of the uh, leader of the group is essential. If the, the leader of the group is open uh, and is well prepared, he can introduce the pilgrims to the experience of the land and of the people. If it is not prepared, open to this, he can create also enormous, enormous damage to the faith and also to the knowledge of the people. This is my experience. But uh, once again, I conclude. I don't think that it's possible to have, generally speaking, maybe for selected groups, generally speaking, in, interreligious groups that make pilgrimage. This is, can be an experience for few, but the pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Land can become, of course, an ex interreligious experience, meaning with that, that in, uh, can become an encounter with diversities in religion, in culture, and in tradition, and languages that can enrich your uh, life of faith. That, uh, because after all, all these people, Jews, Muslims, and Christians of different tradition, are connected with this land with the, and also in, uh, indirectly with our faith. Thank you. So it is a pleasure to, to introduce uh, Rabbi Shmuel Rabinovich, the rabbi of the Western Wall and the Holy Sites of Israel. This is a uh, governmental appointment, a very charged, sensitive one. Sometimes it comes up against conflicts, confrontations. It requires a lot of wisdom in order to be able to negotiate this kind of a uh, position. Uh, we are suffering the consequences of the timetable shift that we naively did in an attempt to be inclusive. We're experiencing the reality of the Holy Land. Uh, the, we're gonna do this a little bit differently because uh, Rabbi Rabinovich is more comfortable delivering his message in Hebrew, which means that I can really say whatever I want in his name as I translate it. <laughs> we call this in Yiddish for Teichst and for Bessons. You know, yes. when you translate someone, you sort of improve on the original. When I think of you who marched so far all the way to Jerusalem, I understand why in our tradition it's called ascending by your feet. Much harder to ascend a steep hill than it is to walk an even path or to descend. The term ascent is because it's hard, complicated. And it's, it's complicated spiritually as it is physically. A person has to also ascend above, rise above his daily life. He has to neutralize himself from self-interest, like we saw this morning, from selfishness, uh, and to rise above that. When uh, we read in the Bible that when, when Israel, uh, when Jacob leaves the land, before he leaves the land, he has a dream. So the dream, according to rabbinic interpretation, takes place right across the street here on the Temple Mount, and he sees the ladder who's based on earth and ascends to heaven. Angels ascend and descend the ladder. And he comes to, and he, he comes to the realization this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. It's not only God's home, it's a gateway. One doesn't only see from above and below, one also sees from below through this gate heavenwards. When we come to this place, we have to look upwards. Whoever doesn't want to rise above his present condition has no place in reality, spiritually, 
in, in a pilgrimage, in an aliyah l'arega, in an ascent. אנחנו גם לעלייה לירושלים קראנו עלייה לירושלים, כי גם לצורך ירושלים צריך לצאת מהאינטרסים האישיים, מהעכשוויות, מהאנוכיות, ולהגיע לירושלים. Same holds true for coming to Jerusalem, which is also called an ascent, because it also requires the same kind of detachment and rising above personal self-interest. מי שחושב על עצמו, מי שחושב על, 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 על אינטרסים פסולים, לא יכול להיות כאן בירושלים. Whoever thinks of false personal interests can't be here in Jerusalem. The history of the Jewish story tells us of Jerusalem, of the Jewish people, and of the Jews who are not Jews. The father of mine, he was a Jew, and he was here for 200 meters from the Jewish country until 1948. Until 1948, my grandfather lived here 200 meters away from the Western Wall. אבא שלי נולד כאן, בירושלים, בתוך העיר העתיקה, 200 מטר מהכותל המערבי. My father was born here, in Jerusalem, in the old city, 200 meters from the western wall. כשהוא היה בן 6, ב-48, גירשו אותו מכאן. He was born in 42, at the age of 6, in 1948, he was expelled. כשאנחנו חזרנו לכאן ב-67, פתחנו את המקומות הקדושים, את ירושלים העתיקה לכל הדתות. When we came back here in 1967, all holy places of all religions were open to all. No one was prevented from having access to their holy sites. First Kings reports the story of Shlomo's King Solomon's prayer at the consecration of the temple. תפילה מדהימה שמופיעה בספר מלכים א', פרק ח' ופרק ט', ומומלץ לכולם לקרוא אותה. First Kings 8 to 9, recommended reading. <laughs> והוא פותח את ליבו ומבקש מאלוקים שכל תפילה וכל תחינה שתהיה לאדם, הוא פרס כפיו אל הבית הזה שאלוקים ישמע את תפילתו. And he says, any need that anyone has, let him turn to this house, pray with sincerity and God will listen. הוא מונה רשימה של מצוקות, רשימה של קשיים שיכול להיות לאדם או לאומה בחיים היומיומיים. מלחמה, רעב, hunger, חולי, illness, כל צרה שרק יכולה להיות. הוא אומר לריבונו של עולם, אלוקים, אם מישהו מגיע אל המקום הזה, תשמע את תפילתו ואל תבדוק בציציותיו אם מגיע לו או לא מגיע לו. And he says, anybody who comes here, listen to his prayer, and don't look through a magnifying glass whether he deserves it or not. And he's, he's even specific about the fact that it includes the non-Jew who comes from a distant land. He comes here, hear his prayers. And God answers him, I've heard your prayer, my heart, my eyes, will be there all the days. God's there. Hence the power of this sight for all the prayers and all the requests that a person makes of his Lord, of his Creator. We know this prayer has the potency or the efficacy of prayer. ולנו אין מונופול על אלוקים. And no one has a monopoly of God, and when he put his, we don't have a monopoly on God. מי שחושב שיש לו מונופול על אלוקים, אין לו אלוקים. Whoever thinks he's got a monopoly on God, he has no God. כשאני חושב, אני לא עולה להר הבית. I personally do not ascend following the halachic tradition that we discussed already to the Temple Mount. לא שהר הבית לא קדוש לנו, אבל בגלל שהוא כל כך קדוש לי, אני לא יכול לעלות להר הבית. It's not that it doesn't have sanctity, precisely the opposite. It's, it's, it's enduring sanctity, despite all the historical changes, prevents me from being allowed to ascend the Temple Mount. אני מתפלל שאני אוכל לעלות לשם, אבל זה נשאר בשלב זה בגדר תפילה, בגדר חלום. It remains a prayer, a dream for me to ascend, but I will not go on the mouth. אבל, יחד עם זה, אני מסתכל על אלה שמונעים מיהודים שלצערי הגדול עושים דבר שמנוגד להלכה ואומרים להם אל תבואו להתפלל כאן. למה? It's very hard for me that there are other Jews, uh, he, the way he describes it, it's, a, it's opposed to halakha. Uh, those Jews may have another view of things, but whatever it is, there are groups of Jews who do want to go up on the Temple Mount, 
And yet, for, for, prayers of, for purposes of prayer rather than just simple tourism, and they are being prevented by the authorities on the Temple Mount from being able to pray. And he says, why is that so? If it's holy, if it's special, why block it? Why prevent others? Let everyone come. I don't ask for anyone's approbation for the fact that Jerusalem and the Western Wall are mine. Prophet Isaiah says, speak to Jerusalem's heart, call to it. Jerusalem is the heart of the Jews. For hundreds and thousands of years, the image of the Western Wall was in, in, were in Jewish homes throughout the world. But whoever wants to ascend can't think only of himself, following this notion of rising above selfishness, he has to think of everyone. It's not enough to think, you have to act. The concluding words of the prayer that we recite, the basic, the basic obligatory prayer that Jews recite thrice daily, is the one who makes peace upon his heavens, let him make peace below. The way it's carried out in terms of the body language is you take three steps back, turn to the left, turn to the right, sort of respectful bows to the left and to the right, and then you proclaim this verse. If you want to have peace, you got to step back. Cast to the right all your personal interests. Cast to the left all your personal interests. Make room for others. That way you can have peace. If you only think about yourself, you can never bring peace. So, ascending in pilgrimage is not just a physical effort, it's the effort to detach yourself from your personal thoughts. You look upwards, not downwards. When you look up, you don't look who's to your right and who's to your left. I think this city has to be a model, a symbol for the capacity to live together in harmony, in brotherhood, a city in which one can live together. It's me. For me, you throw a stone at a woman, which is a current topic right now in Israeli news, which is why he's bringing it up. If you throw, if you throw a stone at a woman, you throw a stone at another human being. That, 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 that's, not, that's not religion. This is, this, is, this is just the opposite of what true religion is about. There's an expression that you utilize the religion for your personal self-interest, like you dig something in order to find something for yourself. So it says religion must be must not be used in self-interest. It's regrettable that in all religions there are people who seek to advance their self-interest through the use of their religion. Fanaticism is just a cover. So if you dig deeper below fanaticism, you find self-interest. Just different ways of saying, here I am, how great I am, this is my place, etc. We have to, we have to denounce fanatics. This is a statement that's meant internally as well as externally, and to remove them from us. Fanaticism 
no, di no religion condones uh, hurting others, war, murder. Yerushalayim is kedusha lekulam. Jerusalem is holy to all of us. Lachen asu lanu leilachem alia. Which is why we must not fight for it. Sheifa lekedusha itchuna miyuchedet, chuna neetzelet, chuna nealet. Aval lo itachen shevelo yali al adat shasheifa lekedusha tavi lemilchama. The aspiration for holiness is something lofty, but that loftiness, it's inconceivable that it should lead to bloodshed. To believe in God is to believe in the life he gave us. So faith in God is respect for everything that live, lives and faith that everything he created is good. We're, we're happy you came here. You're coming here, your ascent. It's not just a physical march, it's a spiritual march. I want to welcome you we, we, I, I wish for all of you to take from here the holiness, the spirit, and to be uh, to rise, to be elated, as we said yesterday, through the potencies and blessings of this place. May the words of the prophets, they shall, nations shall not uh, raise sword upon another, they shall not teach each other war. Let those words be fulfilled. Amen. Thank you. What I would like to now do, in the little time that we have remaining, uh, I think we have very, very clear positions. We have two positions. I need someone to translate for the rabbi while I, I, can, I can't both talk and translate in this, even, even to my capacity. Uh, We've heard the two very thoughtful and very truthful presentations of the situ of the of the larger vision, and I am I am grateful and inspired by the fact that the person who is in charge of the holy places uh, on behalf of the Catholic Christian Church, and the person who is in charge of the holy Jewish holy places on behalf of the Jewish state. Both have in their vision a, a vision that is broad and aware of the presence of the other. A vision that on the one hand serves their community but is mindful of the larger, of the larger goals. And what I want to now ask each of those speakers is, in what way do you translate this broader awareness in the way that you run your holy places in what way do your holy places actually make room for members of other religions if and when they choose to come there? Concretely, I suppose. It's not easy. Let's talk, let's talk for real now. <laughs> it's not easy, but uh, first of all, formation. We have to, uh, um, we have to um, prepare people, all those that are working in holy places, uh, to um, this openness. First of all, learning languages, learning local cultures, of course, the preparation. This, this is a very slow process. We cannot pretend in a way yet to, to change attitudes. Uh, so the first thing is um, formation, formation of those that uh, will uh, work in the other places, formation of the so-called Christian guides. Uh, as I said, uh, the key, the uh, the key element for the Christian pilgrimage are the guides. So the the guides or the uh, spiritual leader, call them whatever as you want, they should 
be prepared to this, not to just to say the obvious and uh, routine things, but uh, what is a real essential uh, for, to know for the pilgrimage, to prepare infrastructures, of course, and what else, and also sometimes uh, um, uh, with the ongoing formation, or once again to all the people that are working, um, uh, to talk, to start talking, uh, and also organize meetings between uh, Muslims, Jews, on the places, explain them, receive. And uh, at the beginning, I remember a few years ago, uh, the place where I live also had a, a, in some places, Montaba and Kama were closed on Shabbat. Because on the Shabbat, the invasion of uh, Israeli, Israelis that want to, uh, wanted to see, and so they uh, created some tensions with the pilgrims. Uh, but now they are open, and uh, it's important also to, uh, to, uh, to teach, to explain how to behave, or to do, or not to do. So uh, the main thing to do is to prepare, to prepare, to talk also. We always talk about dialogue among about the more, more big principles, but we have to, uh, to teach also in the microcosm, the little relations, how to dialogue, how to meet, how to understand each other. This is not that easy as you, uh, as you think, because there are many prejudices. When you come to the Holy Land, you see the wonderful differences, but also you understand sometimes, this was my experience, that you had inside, deep, in your DNA, a lot of prejudices that you didn't know you have. <laughs> and, but when you encounter the other, the Jews, the Muslims, all these prejudices come out. So you have to learn to deal with this, to understand, to open your eyes. So the main uh, thing to do is to work with uh, and information. It's not easy, it's not always successful, but this is the only way you can have. I fully agree. Foundation is education. The first part of education, educating to respect the other. Education is to teach all religions and religions of peace and religions of war. One has to distinguish between dreams and reality. Uh, once upon a time someone came across someone who broke into a bank, robbed four million dollars. So what did you do it? I said I had a dream at night that I'm about to get four million dollars. So what if you had a dream? We all have dreams. You can't always fulfill them. Any human being that dreams is a good thing. But because he fulfills the dream, it's a sin. So it's wonderful if you dream. That's to say, dreams that relate to how you relate to some ideal future where you, you think you'll be the only one. But God forbid that you should try to implement that in reality. All religions have Jews, Christians, Muslims. We all dream. It's a good thing. If you try to translate that into reality, destruction. In our tradition, the third temple, because there's been a first of Solomon that he spoke about and the second one that followed it, but the third one is going to come down from heaven. Certain things you've got to leave to God. He doesn't need our help. When I see those who try to help God, I see what destruction they can, they can bring about. They're bad helpers and he doesn't need their help. אז אני רוצה באמת חושב שצריך לחנך את כולם לאהבה, לאחווה, ולהגיד להם, תשאירו גם לאלוקים את העבודה שלו. אז אני רוצה לחדד את הדברים. מה קורה בכותל מבחינת המקום והיכולת לקבל שם בני דתות אחרות? כמו שאני ציינתי, הכותל המערבי פתוח לכל אדם באשר הוא 365 ימים בשנה. הכותל לא סגור בשבת. 
It's not closed on Shabbat even. <laughs> <laughs> so the Kusta said, now, nowadays even our places are open on Shabbat. Aval, yachad mizet tzarich mizkor shamakom azeh u makom shel tefila merkazo aruchani shel ama yehudi. But we have to remember it's a place of prayer, the spiritual center of the Jewish people. אני לפעמים פוגש סטודנטים שבאים מכל ארץ שהיא, שהם לא יודעים בכלל מה זה יהדות מלבד זה שהם יהודים. הם לא הניחו תפילין אף פעם, הם לא התפללו, הם לא היו מתפללים. הם רק יודעים שהם יהודים. הם עומדים ליד הכותל, ומיד נחלי דמעות זורבות להם. איך, למה, אין לזה הסבר. האבנים הללו חודרות לכל יהודי באשר הוא. אדם יכול להיות רחוק... אדם יכול להיות רחוק מכל שמץ של יהדות, ובמקום הזה מתעורר אצלו ניצוץ יהודי עמוק שחבוי עם מעקר הנפש שלו. ובני דתות אחרות צריכים לכבד את המקום הקדוש הזה. אם אני אראה יהודי שנכנס למסגד, לכנסייה, עם תפילין וטלית, לא רוצה לומר לכם מה אני אעשה לו. אתה רוצה להיכנס למקום, למרכז דתי של דת אחרת? תיכנס בצורה ראויה ומכובדת ותכבד את אלה שהם רואים במקום הזה כמקום קדוש. אל תיכנס עם סמלים דתיים שלך. ואני גם מצפה שבני דתות אחרות שנכנסים לכותל המערבי יכבדו את הדת היהודית. אז אני רוצה לחדד את מה קורה כשנוצרים מגיע עם צלב לכותל? מה אנחנו דורשים ממנו? אני מצפה ממנו, הוא לא צריך להוריד, אבל אני מצפה ממנו שיכסה את הצלב, זה לא צריך להיות מקום בולט בשעה הזאת. ‫אוקיי. <laughs> ודוגמה לסיפור קשה ופרובלמטי. ככה עולה נחתום ונפתח וניתן אולי לאימאם הזדמנות גם לצד איזה קול מוסלמי. תחשבו אם אתם יכולים. סיפור טוב וסיפור רע. אני אומר לכם, תן לי איזה סיפור שאתה יכול לחשוב על ויזיט של אחרת רליגיה, ואיזה פרובלמטי סיפור של ויזיט של אחרת. אני אקח את המיקרופון לפניך כי אני צריך ללכת לסיים. הוא חושב שהוא מתנצל. אני ברחבת הכותל המערבי, ישנה בשעה הזאת. השבעה של חיילים, ולקחתי מעצמי מהזמן שלהם כדי... אני... בשביל מה לדבר על דברים לא טובים? לדבר רק על דברים טובים. הדבר הטוב הוא, כיוון שנמצאים פה... גם נוצרים. אני חושב שהביקור של האפיפיור היה ביקור, גם האפיפיור הנוכחי וגם האפיפיור הקודם, היה ביקור מאוד מכובד. הביקור של האפיפיור הוא ביקור של למעשה המנהיג הדתי הגדול ביותר שיש, במיוחד ויש הרבה מאוד רגישויות בין הנוצרים ליהודים על רקע ההיסטוריה. or most famous uh, uh, religious leader in the world, and there's a very complicated history of tension between Jews and Christians in light of history. 
When he comes to visit the, the Western Wall, there was no attempt to somehow uh, efface the history, but it's a forward, future looking visit that says, we're looking towards the future. To see the Pope reading a chapter from the Bible. Looking at him practicing in the way the Jews do, approaching the, the wall, uh, support, uh, uh, putting his hands in it, touching it, and putting a, 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 a note of prayer inside its cracks. And the previous Pope John Paul II also used that as an occasion to ask pardon for the wrongdoings of the Christians in the past. This was a historical moment. Uh, he succumbed. He will talk about something uncomfortable. Uh, the un uncomfortable things I do sometimes see I see uh, uh, act, small acts of hostility of members of one religion to another. I my problem is I've got 400,000 uh, uh, 400, advisors. <laughs> He's just fired me. <laughs> Out of 10 million visitors, 400,000 have advice to give me how to run the place. <laughs> And for some of those, the wall is their primary home, their private home is their secondary home. And each one has his own craziness. It drives me crazy. And sometimes I've got to use police. And sometimes I have to remove people from the Western world, and I do so. There are pictures of some people who are, who are persona non grata at the wall. And some of them are those who molest or give a hard time to members of other religions. I don't want to tell you about my problems, but I can tell you that I have a lot of problems with other people. I have a lot of embarrassment that's been caused by beats of other people. I don't want to say it's my responsibility to see what goes on there. And so I have to make the effort that those things should not happen. Now, in this case, he was a man who had a Nazi who had a Nazi who had a Nazi who had a Nazi Another, on the other extreme of it, there was a very unpleasant incident when a Christian came and poured a red paint on the wall as a way of expressing his protest against the Gaza war. I respect the opinions of people on various matters. But to go to express your ideas inside holy places, that's not the place to go. In the same way that I condemn people who, as part of, uh, as part of a contemporary uh, political move right now against the government in an attempt to prevent uh, uprooting of settlements, there's a kind of campaign of uh, Right, extreme white hand settlers, and some of them have harmed uh, mosques and potentially churches. I also condemn that. Holy, holy sites are not places to express your political opinions. It's a place. It's a place that has to, by definition, be a place that's. Okay, thank you so much for your remarks. I have two questions I wish to ask you. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, 
clarify, you said you have the dream to go to, on the, to visit the, the Temple Mount, but I wasn't clear. Is it prohibited by the Halakha law for you to go to the Temple Mount? I just want to have clarification on that issue. Um, and the second, and if you did go to the Temple Mount, what, if you were not prohibited, what would you want to do there? And how would you visit it and honor the place in a way that fulfilled your desire as a devout Jew? And it did not um, um, abrade the sensitivities of the sanctity of the place for Muslims. And the second question, which leads from that, is what ideal suggestions do you have for us to enhance relationships between Jews and Muslims, whether it's in this country or uh, around the world, who wish to see uh, steps towards a better relationship between our faith communities? I don't, I don't go to the Temple Mount because of the Halakha. Unequivocally, the Jewish Halakha forbids ascent to the Temple Mount until the Temple is built. I'd like to ascend the Temple Mount both in order to see the history of the Jewish people, also to pray there. לא באמצעים כמובן שהם יפגעו במישהו אחר. Not in ways that would harm, uh, offend others. אבל כמו שכל אחד מתפלל, יכול להביע את דבריו בעל פה, בתוך הלב. But in the same way that someone can express his, his uh, prayers in his heart, by speech. אם הייתי יכול לנשק את הקרקע, הייתי מנשק. If I could kiss the, the ground there, I would. אבל במי, אני, כמו שזה נראה ברגע זה, עד שבית המקדש ייבנה, אני לא אעלה להר הבית. כנראה ההלכה היהודית הייתה חכמה, לא רק מבחינה דתית, אלא גם כנראה מבחינה פוליטית ומעשית. לפני שלושת אלפים שנה היא כבר אסרה עלינו לעלות להר הבית. החלק השני, אני הייתי חושב שמאוד כדאי לשמור על האמת בירושלים. על האמת. אנחנו חופרים פה הרבה מאוד חפירות ארכיאולוגיות. זה חלום של כולנו לגלות לא רק אבנים, אלא את השורשים שלנו. No אין חפירות מתחת להר הבית. מי שאומר שחופרים מתחת להר הבית, הוא אומר שעכשיו 12 בלילה. אני מוכן להכריז כאן על פרס של מיליון דולר, מי שימצא חפירה אחת מתחת להר הבית. The four million dollars from this other guy's dream, he's going to give them as a reward for whoever can do a dig under the Temple Mount. But when I see Sometimes I see pictures that Muslim authorities publish showing digs that are supposedly digs under the Temple Mount, and the fact that they take place 400 meters. meters, but it takes place uh, meters uh, uh, outside, away from the Temple Mount. I don't know whether to laugh or to cry. A Muslim in Saudi Arabia, or in Qatar, or in Syria, thinks that Israel is trying to kill the Arab people. So the Muslim in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, wherever, thinks that people of Israel have some intention to harm the Temple Mount. The Jews sometimes make mistakes, but they don't do it. We make mistakes, not this one. ולכן, לקחת את, ה, את הדבר הזה ולהפוך אותו כאילו כל הזמן לאיום על אל-אקצא. So, to, to, make, to take this cause and to turn it as though there was a constant threat to Al-Aqsa, זה דבר כל כך שקרי, כל כך לא נכון. So false, so untrue. ומביא למתח מיותר. Creates unnecessary friction. רוב, ה, ה, רוב המתחים שיש בין היהודים לבין המוסלמים הם על שום דבר. Most of the tensions that are between Jews and Muslims are on nothing. No, not nothing, based on falsehood. So if you just get past, you know, untruths, our lives would be really so much better. And therefore declare before you, 
there is absolutely no digging underneath the temple. לפני שאני אחפור מתחת הר הבית, חלילה, אני אוכל ביום כיפור. I'll eat on Yom Kippur, which is our holiest day of atonement, when, when if, you know, under penalty of death, you don't eat, uh, before I would even think of digging under the temple. זה אותה עבירה. It's the same sin. וכיוון שאני ביום הכיפורים צם, אני גם לא חופר מתחת הר הבית. And I fast on Yom Kippur and I don't dig under the temple. אני רוצה לאחל לכולנו הרבה שלום, הרבה אהבה, ואני אשמח לכל מי שיתרום למען השלום בישראל. I want to wish all of us love, peace, and I'll be grateful for whoever can make any contribution to peace here. ואני מצפה כמו שאני, באופן אישי, נלחם נגד הקנאים הדתיים. גם כל דת תילחם נגד הקנאות הדתית. In the same way that I combat religious extremism, I look for others to similarly combat religious extremism. הבן אדם הזה הוא אחד הלוחמים הכי גדולים בקנאות המוסלמית. מודה לו. I told him that you're a great fighter against Islamic extremism and he's grateful for your work. הקנאות הזאת הורסת את העולם כולו. He says, extremism destroys the world. to the elevator. I think, let's open the floor for discussions with, with Pierre Baptista for a few minutes if the people have questions for him. Can someone just chair this for a second while I just go out to say, to say uh, uh, who wants the mic? Just ask the questions after courtesy walking. Questions to, to yeah. Did you want to tell your story of good news? You didn't, have, you didn't have your opportunity to tell us a good story or a bad story. We were waiting to hear them. I don't have something specific in mind. The positive aspects, I think, about um, two things: uh, the visits, uh, visit of the students, uh, local students, you know, the local schools, uh, all the schools, Jewish, Jewish school, Muslim schools, whatever, to the only places. These are very interesting, and there's one of the uh, few occasions of uh, interreligious encounter, concrete encounter we have. Um, uh, mostly on Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Now all the Fridays when they, uh, for our ongoing formation, our meetings, we have to avoid Friday and Saturday because Friday and Saturday are the most, <laughs> the most intensive days. And other positive aspects, for instance, are also the um, archaeological excavations. That in the past we did our um, archaeological excavation <coughs> by ourselves. Now we are working together with the Israeli authorities, uh, Magdala and Kafarnaum and uh, Kafarkarnaum now, and uh, together means so, and so also I think it's a beautiful experience, uh, very respectful, very open uh, from all the sides. Negative, there are many, uh, many there are two, unfortunately, uh, there are two kinds, there are the um, uh, everyday episodes of violence, of uh, uh, almost everywhere in uh, recent, in the past was just Jerusalem. Jerusalem is very, uh, it's very religious, so uh, everything's become more tense. But recently, almost everywhere, there are all these young teenagers um, uh, that are becoming violent, uh, always more violent, not only Jerusalem. This, and, uh, this is an uh, everyday problem. But the other problem is that what the rabbi said is not very important. The political views of those places. We are seeing that now the government, Israeli one and also the Palestinian one, uh, they are moving the attention from the political field also to the holy place field, the religious field, and all the, these uh, activities at UN, UNESCO, both sides, Israeli and Palestinians, they are uh, using the Christian holy places maybe for you know, purposes that are not uh, first and foremost religious. This is uh, for us very concerning. Now we have, uh, you got a moment for a couple of questions? Uh, okay, a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? That's the same question I asked the rabbi. What suggestions do you have to improve our relationships that we can do, whether it's here or elsewhere, but specifically in the context of, of, of this location? Now, first of all, as I said, the formation is a very, very important. Formation is not just schools, first of all, to work in the schools, and also um, the media. 
the media is an important role. The media should learn uh, and also teach about dialogue, encounter, not just to present the problems among the peoples, among the religions. We see the uh, Muslims are not in only Kamikaze, Christians are not only Crusaders, and so on. So these things should be, uh, be done in a, a broader context. Um, schools, formation, the media aspects, media, they have a very important role. Religious leadership. Uh, we cannot pretend to change attitude and uh, prejudices and also fears that are in all, uh, uh, they, are, they have uh, centuries of, uh, of life in a few years. But the religious leaders have an important role in guiding their people uh, and also um, teaching and, uh, about dialogue with concrete science, open science, that little by little can create a mentality. Uh, a mentality that says diverse, different is not threat. Any other last question? I see a last hand. Yes, it's not a question.